Hello, a very warm welcome to this first youth research dialogue. My name is Carmen. I'm the project manager and coordinator of the RAIN network here at the Finnish National Agency for Education. And yeah, we are all super excited and happy that um, this thematic online series is finally starting now today uh, with our first topic, how to strengthen the youth sector post pandemic. So thanks for joining us. And it's also super nice and very cool that the new EU youth coordinator, uh, Biliana Sirakova is here. Yeah, um, maybe some words um, what was the idea behind this series? Of course, to make our RAE research findings more accessible, but also um, other European um, youth research studies um, and with the aim to create a dialogue between researchers and their findings. And yeah, we intend to do this with, um, with different topics. So more episodes will still follow this year, uh, most probably the next one in autumn. So check out our, our website and our social media pages um, for any updates and yeah, we will announce everything there. And now I have the honor to introduce the team. So the moderation will be done by Tommy Kilakowski, who is a youth researcher himself. And our digital facilitator is Domagoj Moric. Yeah, you will hear more about the speakers uh, in a second. Enjoy and now over to you, Tommy. You are all warmly welcome to follow our first ever uh, Ray Youth Research Dialogue. Today we'll be talking about, talk, talking about COVID-19 and how to come out of the COVID-19 era. As you know, COVID-19 has had a profound impact on our European societies. One of the consequences of the crisis that has not been discuss, discussed properly enough is the impact of COVID-19 on different generations. We know that pandemics has had a huge impact on, on the young and youth work. Finnish sociologist Eric Allard famously said that well-being is about three different things. It's about having things such as money and income and housing, and it's about loving, having social relationships and friends, and it's about being, it's about self-fulfillment and participation. COVID policies have had an impact on all, on all of these dimensions, on having, on loving and on being. And today we are going to concentrate on looking at precisely this. With us, we have Kristina Pakalso and Andreas Karsten, who will talk, talk about their recent research, research findings, which we all in the youth field need to be aware of. Our dialogue and the presentation will be recorded and will be available uh, on the internet later on, and the video will be edited. We would like, you to, we would like to invite you to comment uh, on the discussions, to ask questions, to raise, raise ideas, so uh, let's be active and let's talk. You can post questions on Facebook, chat, or, or you can use Mentimeter if you, if you prefer that. The code will display on the screen. So without further ado, it's time for our first presentation. Kristina is a youth researcher and a, and a consultant specializing on youth participation and youth policy. Kristina, be my guest. Thanks, Tommy, uh, for that introduction. Uh, today, I'll be sharing some findings uh, from a piece of work uh, that was just completed. Um, Domogoy, maybe if you could uh, bring up the slides. Uh, this is a piece of work that um, I did with my colleagues, Dan and Adina, uh, at People Dialogue and Change on behalf of the European Youth Forum. And uh, the methods that we used uh, included a secondary analysis of a global survey that was done last year, where we focused in specifically on the um, outcomes to the survey of uh, 32 European countries with a sample size of just over 4,400 young people between 18 and 34. 
um, as well as focus groups and interviews with 29 young people across Europe uh, who themselves um, self-identified as being uh, within marginalized situations or backgrounds, as well as a policy view, a review, and a literature review. Uh, next slide. So the, um, the findings really focused in on three general themes. And the first theme is education. What we found is that nearly one in 10 young students uh, were not getting any access to courses, teaching, or training. And this was irrespective of the fact that education at this time was brought online. There was still uh, nearly 10% who could not even access those opportunities. Next slide. Similarly, one in 10 students think that the pandemic will cause them to completely fail their education. Uh, and 40% are worried that their education will be delayed. Next slide. So we need to keep in mind that uh, during this time, uh, the rapid move to online also did not necessarily affect all students equally. Um, of course, uh, when we think of those who lacked computer access or internet access, we can definitely see how they could be within that 10%. But also on the other side, um, it's uh, digitalization of education actually provided some students with opportunities. So for example, those in rural areas. Uh, this research participant had said, I left university quite some time ago, but I found for myself that I used the time in lockdown to do remote learning university modules. Other people I know did the same. People around here were quite positive and used the time well. Moving to the next slide, uh, looking at employment, we know that as of March 2021, um, 2.95 million young people under the age of 25 in the EU were unemployed. Um, unemployment is a challenge for youth unemployment is a challenge irrespective of the pandemic and was uh, much more, uh, much so before the pandemic. However, during this period, uh, Eurostat um, um, calculated that youth unemployment rate rose from approximately 14.9% to 17.1%. In the next slide, we see that one in 10 young people saw their future career prospects with fear. And among uh, the young people who answered the survey, those in marginalized situations were more than twice as likely to have stopped working than other people, other young people. Um, if we see in the next slide, the quote, the challenges during the pandemic therefore can set young people on a life course um, with respects to their career that was much more different than they expected. One research participant said, maybe I shouldn't focus on my dream job anymore. I have to focus on a job that will give me money to live. Another had said, the jobs that are not the ones you studied for, you have to lower your standards. And we see that young people are, are faced uh, with this kind of challenge. In the last um, component of our research, we looked at mental health. Um, this question um, about uh, if young people themselves are experiencing anxiety or depression was calculated using a 20 point scale where respondents to the question would look at multiple statements and would uh, rate how they were feeling in the past two weeks across um, this scale. And so the outcome of this was that nearly two thirds of young people uh, may be affected, uh, possibly having anxiety or depression, or probably having anxiety or depression. So here we can see that uh, we have somewhat of a mental health crisis on our hands. In the next quote, uh, we'll see some context uh, to this, um, some uh, depression uh, experiences that young people may be having. I don't think it's fair that we have young people approaching 30 years who have to move back with their parents. This is happening a lot right now, but also before the pandemic. We don't help them with starting their own life. It's unfair that we are ignoring this big group of young people who can't get employed. So just on the last slide there, I just want to wrap it up in the sense that the big takeaway is that education, employment, and mental health outcomes are not separate, but rather very much interlinked. How a young person fares in education will affect their chances for employment naturally, and if they do better or worse in employment also has an impact on their mental health. But really what we're seeing here is actually more of a devil's circle where young people's poor mental health will also likely worsen their chances at employment and educational prospects. And this is their poor mental health and well-being now and their prospects in the future. Um, therefore, we know mental health is not solely a mental intervention, but we need to look at the supports that address the socioeconomic determinants of health. And I, I think that this is really a, a key thing for us to remember when thinking about how to strengthen the youth sector. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for your interesting and worrying research findings. I have to say already that I find the term pandemic scar 
really evocative. That's really moving and touching, and perhaps we will start using that. Please, uh, I would like to remind you that you can ask questions uh, on Facebook and on Mentimeter, and we will uh, answer them during the dialogical session. Next to go is Andreas. Andreas is a member of the transnational research team of Ray Network. On to you, Andreas. Well, thank you, Tommy, and thank you, Christina, um, for uh, highlighting a few of the findings from the study uh, you did for the European News Forum. Uh, it's uh, very cool to uh, to have you here today. Um, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the Ray findings, and then uh, we, of course, also have um, some dialogue uh, in this youth research dialogue coming up. Um, so we started about um, 14, 15 months ago, surveying um, young people who are typically involved in youth work and also shape youth work very proactively, as well as youth workers and youth leaders who conduct and organize youth work. And you see here on this first slide um, a couple of the things that youth work managed to do under pandemic conditions in the past year and a half across Europe, um, with 74% of young people saying that youth work helped them to uh, deal with the crisis, gave them something meaningful to do during a time when um, they needed that. 71% uh, of young people saying youth work made them laugh, made their pandemic days better, made them feel better. 68% of young people saying youth work helped them to understand and interpret the news. And if you want what youth work managed to do um, under conditions that we'll look at in a moment is put some of the plasters you saw on the last slide of Christina over young people's pandemic scars. Um, but the overall situation of young people, of course, um, was improved through that, but not massively changed. And youth work managed to do that under quite horrifying conditions, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, uh, where 95% of youth workers say the pandemic affected their youth work majorly, 84% um, saying organizations, um, their organizations were affected majorly or moderately, and only 6% of youth workers being able to say they could still reach all of the young people that they would normally work with. So all in all, what our research has shown over those past 15 months is that youth work needs massive recovery support. This is nothing that a largely voluntary driven sector would be able to manage um, on their own. And that's why we started looking in the past weeks at um, the recovery and resilience facility of the European Union, the main instrument for recovery um, across Europe. And uh, what you see uh, two slides down now, I believe, yeah, exactly, is that the Recovery and Resilience Facility um, has uh, six different pillars. And the sixth one is called Policies for the Next Generation and very specifically speaks about policies for children and young people. So that's in principle a promising start. And then on the next slide, you also see that member states who um, are asked to submit national plans for the usage of this facility have to promote policies for the next generation and that the actions that they suggest should ensure that the next generation of Europeans is not permanently affected by the impact of the pandemic and that the generational gap is not further deepened. The problem begins, however, when these pillars are translated into components, which you will see um, in a moment exactly, uh, because these six pillars, as promising as in particular that six pillar policies for the next generation sounds and reads, were then translated to seven components, which have these catchy titles here, scale up, power up, reskill, upskill, connectivity, administration, a wave of renovation, and clean, smart, fair urban mobility. Now, in the guidance that the European Commission has developed for member states, um, only three of these talk about young people, um, and these are the ones that you see here in pink, reskill, upskill, digital connectivity, public administration, and that last one only talks about young people in the sense of making the workforce and administration younger. So what we have done then um, is ask ourselves, how do national recovery and resilience plans actually cover young people and ideally also youth work? And what we have found so far is 
um, under the premise that so far only 10 national recovery plans have been endorsed by the European Commission and all very, very recently. Um, the first ones were Portugal and Spain on the 16th of June, so really only a couple of days ago, and the last ones were just yesterday, Italy, Germany and Latvia. Um, so if we look a little bit tired, it's because we did a night shift to analyze these. Um, and what we have found is that eight of these national recovery plans do have dedicated youth actions in them, but that they exclusively focus on education, employment, and to some extent entrepreneurship, and the transition from education to employment, and the transition from education to entrepreneurship. So if you think back to what Christina just showed us, is that there is one huge topic already missing from these first 10 national recovery plans, which is the mental health of young people, but um, very importantly also for the research work that we have done, what seems to be the case with these first 10 national recovery plans is that youth work as a sector um, actually is falling through the cracks at the moment. And that is something that indeed is very much reason to worry because in the past weeks and months, this is what the sector has been heard and has been told all the time is that national recovery plans will have the task to support youth work structurally in its recovery uh, post the pandemic. And at the moment, those national recovery plans show that it's failing to do so. Thank you very much. And uh, back to Tommy. Thank you, Andreas, for your wonderful presentation, which provided us with another really good metaphor about Yulferg falling through the cracks. So we have two, pandemic scar and Yulferg <laughs> falling through the cracks. So we are not in a happy place, I guess. I would like to pose a first question for Christina. Could you please comment on, uh, on the findings of Andreas? In your study, which you did, with, uh, did you talk about triple losses, educational loss, economic loss, and also poor mental health. And these losses now form a pandemic scar, which is likely to follow young people for the rest of their lives. And you write that unless governments and institutions act today to deliver a youth inclusive recovery. In your opinion, what role can youth work play, play in this, in youth inclusive recovery? Thanks, Tommy. I, I actually, I found it very striking. Um, and uh, I, I, I love the, um, this type of overview of basically this is what, uh, you know, this is what those of powers have said. This is what they're going to do. Let's actually look to see if they're doing it. And this type of policy analysis is exactly my job. So I'm happy to see it. Um, I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's encouraging, of course, to see that young people are mentioned. However, I wonder if it's just, you know, we're so used to looking at youth policy and thinking, well, if it exists, then that's great because we're, we're so used to only getting scraps um, recognition in the youth sector that sometimes we sort of stop there. But I, I think that this is precisely the moment where we need to be more critical about, you know, what, what do all of these words really mean? Um, I think it's exactly right, as Andreas mentioned, that mental health as um, a thematic focus is a huge gap. Um, I think that uh, when we look at recovery and resilience in general, I think that um, mental health, broadly speaking, when we look at, at sort of this health emergency that we have with the pandemic, it's an aspect that is missing for the entire population, not only just for youth. But I think uh, in particular too, when actually thinking about the implementation of these policies, the fact that the youth sector, the youth work sector in particular, is not seen as one of the main instruments or vehicles through which we are actually going to be implementing and carrying out these, these national plans is, is extremely worrying. And I think it's worrying for, for many reasons. It's worrying in part because the governments had previously mentioned as and had promised that, you know, that recovery um, plans would help to strengthen the sector. But it's also worrying because to meet this ambition of needing to have full scale societal recovery and resilience after such a traumatic uh, event will require all hands on deck. And to think that the public authorities are going to be able to do that solely through public provision of services and not engaging the largely voluntary sector, the youth work sector, uh, youth organizations, I think is really short-sighted and also not very strategic. I mean, we have 
limited amounts of resources, we have limited amounts of people and services, why not think more creatively about it? So that's a little bit worrying. I, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about that. And I think as well too, I'm curious, maybe Andreas knows, insofar as how, how much were young people also involved in you know, the kind of creation and the design of these plants? This is also something which we're seeing um, at the moment is that in this recovery and this emergency mode, we're sort of bypassing all of the requirements um, that we put in place to really have the participation of young people. Um, so yes, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a quagmire, it's a, it's a hard place to start. What can youth work do? Well, what can youth work do when they're not given the responsibility to do something? So it's, yeah, that's my question. And on to Andreas, Christina sort of passed the ball to you to use a football metaphor. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, regarding the question, were young people involved? So technically, all member states are obliged in the development of these plans to run consultation procedures, and they also have to describe these procedures when they submit national plans. But so far, those 10 that we have looked at over the past days, the descriptions are very generic. Um, and um, we have only been able to identify real actual numbers for youth organizations consulted in one country, which I'm not going to call out now. Um, and they had consulted two uh, youth organizations. And, you know, granted, they have to and are obliged to and invited to consult a, a whole range of stakeholders. And these recovery plans are obviously not only about young people, but young people are one of the six pillars. So, you know, they warrant more attention and more inclusion and more participation than to youth organizations um, about some of the actions that concern young people. Um, so indeed, so far, I would say quite a big gap between political promise and policy reality. There's a question on Facebook and that's to you, Andreas. Where can you access national recovery plans in English or can you? Um, um, yes and no. So the uh, European Commission has a website for the recovery facility where once they endorse national plans, they uh, publish um, a, a documentation uh, in English that describes their assessment of the national recovery plan. Um, and as well, a commission staff working document that's quite extensive that describes the plan in detail, but the plans don't have to be submitted in English. And those 10 were by majority submitted in their national language. Um, so, uh, but uh, also these are at least linked to from the European Commission side, the original plans in their language. So we couldn't always trace the originals on the government website. They already moved, but they exist. There's a question to Christina on Mentimeter. How did you manage to identify which of the impact was due to the COVID pandemic and which one is just being part of being young? Uh, with well, regards, the methodology. Sure, with regards to um, mental health or to, to all of the impacts, I'm, I'm assuming. I mean, essentially the, the frame of the survey as well as the focus groups is really to, um, to focus specifically on the impact of the last year and uh, what has sort of changed in their, um, you know, their particular circumstances and, and their feelings and perspectives. However, that being said, what did come out very strongly is that, you know, it was already difficult to find a job. Can you imagine how much more difficult it is now? Or, you know, we didn't have any mental health services for young people in our community before the pandemic. And yet now it seems like young people are struggling even more. So again, it, it of course is reflective of, um, of the existing circumstances. And if anything, the pandemic really has shown a light in terms of how deep those cleavages are. And uh, I think that it's, it's really accelerated also for a lot of young people, the fears there were is, but also the, their vulnerability in terms of their material circumstances, in particular for those who were already much more vulnerable before. Thank you, Christina. I have another question for you. Before that, I would like to remind you that if you want to, you can use the Mentimeter to pose questions to our experts here. So, Christina, uh, one of the things that hasn't been properly discussed, I think, is, uh, is the impact of 
COVID-19 and the pandemic on civil society. So in your opinion, since you've studied youth participation, what are the key challenges at, at the moment facing youth organizations? I think one of the key challenges is is this digital challenge. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, of course, in, in many ways for moving our organizing, our, our activism, or, or just, you know, the way that we sort of communicate and hang out with each other online has brought a lot of opportunities, especially within the constraints. But I think, um, you know, vi- Zoom fatigue is real. It's it's also now um, because young people themselves are also studying online. Um, you know, there is a sense of this now sort of coming full circle. At what point is the online um, environment also contributing to our mental health stress? You know, and so one of the um, the recommendations from uh, the European Forum in the report is a recognition of of maybe this concept of the right to disconnect. And I think the right to disconnect um, relates to our work um, and how a lot of it has has gone online, certainly to the level uh, at which we're connecting um, online for education. But I think we'll also um, apply to what we use our extracurricular time for, and that can also include our participation and our activism. I think that this is a challenge um, because for a lot of young people, um, we just have competing, there are competing um, um, things for our attention. And when they're all online, I think it, it becomes challenging. And we have to think creatively about how to to use um, these, these tools in a way that also um, is fruitful, but also doesn't start to, to wane in, in its productivity for young people. So Andres, we know uh, from recent trauma studies that other people, our friends, our peers, are really important source of well-being. Uh, in the post-traumatic era. And now then they are coming out of COVID crisis. Uh, in your opinion, what would be a proper policy response to help youth sector organizations to be able to blossom in the post-pandemic era? Um, no, that's not a small question. Um, but luckily for, uh, for me and us, the youth sector actually did convene not long ago in December last year for a big youth work convention and actually discussed that at length. And, um, and part of the bond process and the declaration of um, the youth work convention was exactly the question of what does the youth sector, what does youth work um, a need across Europe to to operate in this uh, new normal, as uh, as we called it in December, and and there is a whole range of things. I mean, one is um, uh, very simply and straightforwardly support organizations and teams and networks. Um, from the smallest youth club to the largest organization in getting digitalization right. I mean, we have seen now in the pandemic that we have neglected this topic as a field for far too long, and we need to be able to find an authentic educational approach that reflects the values of non-formal education also in online spaces, because they're not going to disappear, pandemic or not. Um, and um, another big aspect, I think, is that we have to start encouraging and finding resources, mobilizing resources for working better together with other professions. Mm-hmm. Imagine what we would have been able to do if we had a closer cooperation with mental health professionals in those past 15 or 18 months. And that as well is something that as a field, um, we have not been particularly great at um, in Europe in the past. And um, of course, that needs, you know, all of that needs resources, it needs unequivocal support that goes beyond words, and is not just um, our oral pledges, but actually pledges with a budget and where uh, to walk the talk and put the money where your mouth is. Christina, do you want to continue from there? Sure, I think at that point of um, more uh, cross sectoral cooperation um, and and sharing of expertise is, is a really important one, which also came up in our research. Um, we found that by default, actually, some organizations um, found themselves doing this by default. And so, for example, we spoke with um, some rural youth organizations who themselves were not even necessarily considering themselves to be particularly youth focused, but happened to have a lot of young people that they work with, mostly providing um, you know, uh, other types of like social activities and, and other kinds of things. 
but then during the pandemic um, found themselves um, needing to grapple with um, a suicide within their, uh, their community. And so very quickly, many of uh, those um, people who were working in this rural youth organization very quickly learned about mental health supports. Um, and they needed to then call on um, experts within uh, their communities to, to, you know, do workshops that were specifically for young people and, and do training as well for, for the people they're working with. Similarly, um, you know, because of different challenges relating to employment, a lot of, um, you know, youth organizations started to run CV writing workshops, you know, so it was like a thing where it's like, yeah, employability is a youth thing. Sometimes we do that, but we normally do sports. But yet they found, okay, actually, but this is this is now just the situation we're in and we want to be responsive. And so they just started to do that more often and wanting to look um, towards their uh, local employment services and, and other professionals in the community. So I think if there was a way in which we could facilitate these interlinkages more, I think is is better. Because basically, you know, this is this is where young people are. These are the, the groups that they're a part of, the organizations that they come to. And I think the more multidimensional and the more dynamic we can make them in terms of, of the ways in which they can support young people, I think is is only better. Andreas talked about the third European Youth Convention and the bond process. One of the key concepts of that, uh, that convention was community of practice of youth work. And they had this idea that we are a community of practice, a European youth work community. And now when we are, we are coming out of a COVID-19 crisis, what would, be your, what would be your ideas about what sort of support we need from European institutions? How, how could they help youth work to do the job? That and that's a question? a question for both of you. Ah, okay. Yeah. So you want to go ahead and start? No, no I, I would be pleased to hear uh, what you think, Andreas. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, sure. Um, <laughs> so I think, um, you know, what one one structural dilemma that the youth sector has across Europe and most countries is that um, it basically depends on project funding and how hard, we, how hard that backfires um, at a time when each project is grinding to a halt unwillingly. We have now seen in the past 15 months and the economic impact that that has had. And what I would wish for this community is um, that European institutions as well as national institutions walk away from this excessive focus on project only funding and give structures and teams, however formal or informally they are organized across Europe, some structural funding that allows them to cover their basics, their bookkeeping, their administration, their equipment. It's really not hard to do. It barely registers in the last corner of a national or European budget, the money that our sector would need for that. But we always have to hide that in project budgets, and it's tiring for everyone. And everyone has been talking about this for two decades now, and we have never done it and now would be the time to do that and finally right that um, massive wrong that's been haunting us for more than two decades. What about you Christina? I mean unfortunately I don't think that I have I have much more um, creative thoughts to add I think I think you're right that that it, resourcing is a huge challenge I think that on the individual level um, you know we see from your uh, your report and uh, and the survey with with youth workers is that you know because of how precarious their jobs are um, you know many of them have to consider leaving and I think that the retention of youth workers and and the fact that their jobs don't have a lot of stability because organizations don't have a lot of stability because funding has no stability. I mean, is a huge danger for the sector when you have, a, you know, a professionalized group that you can't retain. And uh, I think that this um, this is a huge challenge and, and definitely probably at the root cause of, of a challenge, uh, our challenges in the youth sector. I thank you, both of you. We are rapidly approaching the end of our discussion. There's a lot of room for criticism here, but in your work, we have to use the language of hope as well. So, uh, do you want to give shortly your final comments on on is there a reason to be hopeful, or do you see glimpses of hope in for the young people in Europe 
or for the youth work in Europe. And please be rather short. And there? <laughs> After you this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hope. Okay. I mean, you know, I think 2008, you know, economic crisis battered young people. And it's the same generation of young people who are also being battered now. I mean, I, I think, I think that that it's it's a continual challenge. Um, you know, so 2008 battered them. Hopefully, 2019 will radicalize them. But again, radicalize can go in so many directions. And if anything, I just I hope that the frustration um, and the the essentially the despair that we're feeling right now will only help us to create something productive from it. I mean, either that means a repoliticization of youth work, that means more activism, that means more outward anger towards those in power who refuse to do things. Um, you know, that means hopefully more honest conversations. So unfortunately, I mean, I think that that's the best that we could hope for. I do have to say though, that it was very hopeful uh, on Andreas's slide about um, the degree to which youth work had contributed to um, well-being outcomes for young people. I think that's extremely important. I think the fact that young people engage in this work, that organizations exist for young people, have a mental health impact, which we are not, which we are are underappreciating. Um, the fact that we help to connect young people, I think that that is itself a public and mental health service, and I think that 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 we should also concentrate. Yeah, for me, very much the same um, to see in our work and in the case studies that we are currently conducting across Europe, how much youth work has been able to contribute under detrimental conditions really gives me hope and makes me um, uh, makes me hopeful and optimistic. And then another beacon of hope for me is how much there is at the moment street activism and policy activism around the question of climate change and how much that youth movement and youth driven movement is currently trying to bridge the gap between young people and politics by running for parliament uh, and and political positions from the very local to national and and i'm sure uh in and soon in the future also for the european parliament and it's um, something that we've been worried about in the research community, as we, as the three of us certainly know, uh, for a long time, is whether or not that kind of um, movement would ever uh, bridge um, into politics and policy making. And I'm very happy to to see that uh, coming. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Christina. Thanks for everyone at the audience. It's great to have you here. This was the first free youth research dialogue, and we are planning to do more in the year still. And most probably we will continue in, uh, with the next one in the autumn, and we welcome all of you to join us again. We hope to see you on board. Check out the Ray website and the social media, media pages for updates. And before we do the next uh, dialogue, I wish all of you a sunny, eventful, and safe summer. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>